Oh, there she is. Okay. Everybody awesome. here? Yes, good evening. Okay, everyone is, we have everybody on board. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. The, this is the virtual June work session for the town of Upper Marlboro. It is June 22nd, 2021 and seven o'clock. Thank you. May I have a roll call, please? President Linda Penoyer. Present. Commissioner Janice Duckett. Here. Commissioner Sarah Franklin. Present. And Dave Williams, town clerk, all present. Okay, please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, uh, visual, visible, <laughs> with liberty and justice for all. Okay, our first order of business this evening is the draft red light and speed camera RFP this is for discussion. And the uh, yes, Mayor, this is a uh, draft RFP. It has not gone before the town attorney yet. We just wanted to have a chance for the, uh, the board and um, staff to provide any inputs they may have so that the attorney's not seeing it twice um, and doubling our fee for it. Um, but pretty much it's in seeking an RFP being released for red light speed cameras. Um, right now we're saying just three intersections, main at water, um, 202 at 725, and then 301 at 725. And then the two speed cameras, one at the uh, St. Mary's school and one at 725 at Marlboro Drive that the new state law authorized. Uh, this is a safety-based initiative due to the high uh, traffic speeding issues. And then we've also in the an area we're annexing we know there's an issue with uh, people running the red lights, especially at 202 at 725, um, has had quite a few instances of accidents at that intersection. So that's why it is a safety um, based initiative. And uh, I have a timeline there, but pretty much we are um, looking to get it approved at the July town meeting, have it out for 31 days. Um, and then possibly award it in September. Um, I just have, I have a question because you said the locations. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, I didn't see them on here. I don't know if I just- It's not in the, the, it's not in the RFP. It's just, <laughs> you're not losing it. I just um, broke it out. I didn't know if we wanted to include that in there or not. Um, um, I don't know. I my thought when you were saying it is why 725 and Marlboro Drive. That was the closest directly. intersection in, in that area is where we've always applied to State Highway to have one put right there between oh, Marlboro in front of a Trinity Cemetery because there's no houses there. Oh, because and that's where our current speed sign is. Yeah, I was just thinking because like the danger area is closer to rectory but i guess people are going fast there they're going fast yeah directory anyway exactly and it can always it'll be up to the firm and working with state highway to get uh exact location details uh, and right away that'd be up to the firm to work with state highway so that'll be ultimately who kind of chooses it but um sorry i'm just letting people into the room thank you oh, no Um, I know there was a question about insurance stuff that was uh, based off of some other ones we had seen. Um, so obviously the town attorney should hopefully have more insight into that once we send it to him. Um, um, Chief, did you have anything to add or any thoughts on it? Nothing at this time. Everything sounded good. Okay. 
people are looking forward to this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've talked to quite a few uh, new residents moving in who have, who have expressed some concerns. Um, now, I did put this at 24 months. That's usually what we do with our RFPs as a two-year contract. I don't know if you want to keep that as is, um, think about it or change it. Um, that was an area I had highlighted as well. Or if you guys, if the board's good with the two years and keep it standard, we can do that. I mean, there's some cases where we regret our two year contracts, but I think it's better because you're not like constantly reviewing it, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, oh. so we just have to be careful about our selection, I think. Exactly, and then obviously this is the, the first round. So if we do choose a really good vendor, um, we have the opportunity to possibly extend it the next round too. Okay. Um, I think that's good. I did get a, a resident sent me a message saying, hey, see uh, cameras, red light cameras, yes, go <laughs> before the meeting. So they wanted to put that comment in. Now we have to do is remind them that when to be careful what you wish for because they're on camera too. <laughs> So true. Um, one thing I may add here as well is possibly um, having it collect traffic data, having the firm collect traffic data and provide it to the town, not just on violators, but overall, um, especially with the the, inter the red lights, cameras, and the, the speed cameras, possibly have a car counting capability to give the data as well. And of course, we can move speed, whatever roadways, we can move our speed signs around as well to help um, overall get that traffic data we're looking for. I think that's a good idea, um, but maybe we can have them break it out so that if it's a lot more expensive to have that capability versus not having that capability, so we can see the different prices. Absolutely. Let me turn that break it down. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none, uh, you may also, if you think of something later, email the town info at uppermarlboromd.gov and uh, put your comments in that way as well. And I will uh, put this through the town attorney. If there's any large changes, I'll notify the board um, and it'll just be included in the July town meeting packet. See you next time, see you. Okay, the next up is legislative planning with Greenwell Consulting. This is a discussion. Uh, do we have Greenwell with us this evening? Let me see, Kate. Let's see them all. I just texted Jacob. Oh. Uh, yeah, I texted Jacob. I don't know if perhaps we want to move on to elections and see if they hop on. Okay, uh, we will move on to the next item, which is election charter amendment process. Uh, this is a word discussion. Cal, do you want to do some background on this? Absolutely. Um, the board, the past couple boards have had um, quite a few conversations about it, um, especially in the recent years and with Open Meetings Acts and whatnot, the town's a three-person um body of elected members has grown to be um, a hindrance in some times and we're one of the few within the state of Maryland that only has three even Eagle Harbor um, only 70 residents has five commissioners um, so the the thought is for the board to move up to a total of five commissioners or elected officials um, which is pretty standard amount for uh, municipalities that go upwards of 3,500 residents just to put in scope of um, where that goes. So I think that they're texting. Nope. Um, there we go. Apologize. I'll make sure Greenwell wasn't texting back. Um, so we have, I sent out a charter section converted to Word document for the commissioners to kind of play around with. Um, obviously, this is just the election sections. There may be some other sections we have to edit, um, but the goal is. Um, 
changing it to a, a three to five member board. Um, and that kind of triggers some other questions as well as to how the, uh, the present mayor is elected. Um, there aren't a whole lot that choose amongst the count or the commissioner council of how of who's going to be serve as mayor. Normally that is done if there is a mayor that has elected separately and then the body chooses like a council president amongst themselves is normally where you see that inner council decision. Um, so there's some options you could do the highest vote count is something that kind of municipality mid sized municipalities do so the highest vote count is mayor second highest is a, a vice mayor or mayor pro tem. Um, you could have it run separately so you have four commissioners running you run for a commissioner spot and then you have people running for the mayor spot. Um, I put in there the council president because that would be kind of how we do it now is that inner discussion and vote. Um, amongst the board. Um, and then the other topics we could kind of consider is uh, increasing number of town election judges. Currently it's at three. Um, we may want to consider setting a range of three to five. That way, if we only have three residents, we're not limited. Um, but five obviously helps kind of keep that continuity um, of election judges doing. Uh, there's been some discussions on uh, section 8233, um, editing that. Uh, obviously all this is in addition to some other little items throughout the election section um, and then also discussions on as the town looks to grow um, at what point is a residential property when can those residents run for office when can they vote and whatnot um, perhaps like if someone's lived just outside the town limits like in our phase two or three area um, on 725 they've lived there for 20 years and then they get annexed in maybe they want to run for they've been in the area they know the area enough it's not just some new person who just moved in from another state um, and they could have some fresh input but so those are all some just some of the questions to consider but I just this is of course one of many discussions I didn't want to put too much on I want to definitely open up to the board to the public um, on that so I'll kind of turn it over to the commissioners if you had any discussions. Can I uh, interject just a quick little note? Uh, yeah, the worst part of elections, I've done seven town elections and three special elections, I think. Um, the most uh, complicated aspect of our charter provisions for elections involves that organizational meeting, which is in the charter now specified as one week after the election at 8 p.m. Um, you run into so many problems, uh, oh, it conflicts with so many things. The lawyer, we've been having to, to utilize the legal advice almost every election because where <clears throat> holiday falls, you know, can affect everything. If there's any way you know, to, to keep, uh, keep that idea present, that that's, that's almost like a trap. That really, uh, it's, it's an unusual uh, routine as well. Um, so if the structure was favored to be the most votes uh, is, uh, will that, that declares the mayor, uh, as, et cetera, uh, then that eliminates the need for an organizational meeting, which its only purpose is to choose the president amongst the commissioners that were elected and now with open meetings, that's that's a very different kind of difficult situation. It used to be done just between the three elected officials. Now it's an open meeting. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying that it's just fraught with all kinds of extra work for everyone and a very unusual charter provision for elections. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, and that's, that's definitely something that uh... Dave and I have talked about over the past couple of elections. That's a big provision as well in there. Obviously, if if we change it and popular vote for mayor, like like Dave said, that that need for that um, organizational meeting will be eliminated. And that is also an example of something that is kind of tied into this charter change, but is outside the uh, the section of elections that's under an organizational meeting. It's a yeah. So don't strain yourselves too much looking in this yeah, section. Yeah, trying to find it. But that's oh, one of the examples right. where it get tied in. There's also some sections on the president that could get tied into this as well. So that's, I only included the election section because I'll probably see the most work 
Um, mm -hmm. And I'm waiting on a kind of a memo of law from the town attorney to share with the board and the public where he kind of like goes through the charter, figures out all the sections we have to change for that. So that's forthcoming as well um, to be of a private more background, but. Yeah, I mean, extra, the extra, pro, one of the extra problems with the way it's set up is that trying to schedule the clerk of the circuit court to administer the oath there and or and the commissioners, it's always been a juggling game and very problematic to schedule. Just want to add that. Um, so I just, while we have Dave's expertise, I was wondering if you think it's just not tying that organizational meeting to a specific date or if it's what do you think is the it's, easy, best it's the date it's the fact that the charter says exactly one week after at 8 p.m okay um and that there's a window you know you have the elections but then you don't want to right now there's been instances i'll, I'll give you instances yeah, I can see what, how they're received <laughs> lapse of power. In other words, right. there is a provision that it says the newly elected commissioners will take office as soon as the last one leaves or the last, excuse me, the last board will stay in effect until the new board is sworn in by the clerk of the circuit court. So if you have to wait a week already, so you have an election. Uh, it's hard for me to recreate that right now because I really didn't bring a, yeah. you know, a sample board, but I can truth honestly tell you, it's every time, almost every election, it can be a nightmare to figure out how is this gonna happen? And there's all kinds of misinterpretations that go on of our charter um, provisions for elections. Uh, you, you know, we, we try to do it, uh, you know, I, I worked with one board that said, okay, yeah, we don't want to have a lapse of power, so we'll do, we'll do this, and then only to find out, oh, no, we can't do that at all, because case study says, da, 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 and here we are spending money almost mm -hmm. every election to make sure that it's all working right, because uh, it's one of those difficult uh, situations, and if there's just a a way to, to make sure you don't corner, you know, get yourself painted into a corner with this provision that says you're going to have this organizational meeting mm -hmm. in order to elect, uh, to select the, right. um, the, pre the president yeah. and also treasurer. Um, it's, uh, I, I lost my train of thought on that, but um, <laughs> It's, uh, You've answered my question, though. <laughs> okay. All right. That's good. Good enough for me. <laughs> but if we if we if we're looking at like the questions about the mayor and the president about how many um, positions we'll actually have, um, then that could actually remove that altogether, wouldn't it? It would just you know. Yeah, I was thinking the same, Mister Dave. <laughs> yeah. Well, that would remove it altogether if they if. It, depending upon what direction we chose, whether we, we have the mayor uh, run separately uh, right. or just as the, there's different scenarios. Mm -hmm. Several of them would remove that problem. Yeah. I mean, saying as though it hasn't been updated since 2001. Clearly, I can see the questions that you've already created here, top of some of the things that we've thought about, I'm sure. Um, yes, this is definitely um, something that we need to make happen and have some serious discussion about. So um, I don't know how much the topic or how much of this discussion we're going to have tonight. And I guess it's just more or less um, just trying to figure out which direction we, we would like to go or um, Kyle. Is that pretty much your thought process? Absolutely, yeah. Um, that's. I just want to get from the board kind of directions, kind of highlight the key changes we want to make. And then mm -hmm. also, I'm sure the board wants to bring it to the public in some way or another, how to engage with the public. Um, I'm kind of holding the landings newsletter back. We could put a quick thing in there if we want to have a, a public forum or discussion, open discussion um, on this with the public. Um, I don't know if we want to do like a survey monkey or something like that. 
Um, but obviously one of the big things will be getting that memo of law from attorney best because he's going to digging in the deep background. He's able to identify all the sections um, and tell us like, yes, we can do it all in one fell swoop. We can change the election date. We can change, we can go from three to five. Um, this is how the mayor is going to be selected. And that's one charter amendment, or it, he could come back being like, okay, that's because there's only a certain amount of things we can do per charter amendment. We can't just rehab the whole charter at once. <laughs> so we may have to break it up into two. It could may have to be one for three to five commissioners and how the mayor select then another one for the date of the election or something like that. Okay. Okay, uh, that does bring up the question of uh, the date of the election. Mm -hmm. uh, we have always elected, had our elections in January. Uh, Sarah and uh, Janice were both lucky not to have to run during the Christmas holidays and the cold weather. Uh, it does get cold <laughs> out there. Uh, that is something we might want to, uh, just looking at how other municipalities do it. Four municipalities do it in November and 18 do it in May. That's when the elections are made. The prep and, uh, so we're open to suggestion. I just uh, think that we could go to a more pleasant month. Yeah. I think the other real benefit of moving to November specifically would be that usually it's like a slower time and not as much, you know, before budget season, there's less happening. So that gives the new commissioners a little more time to get in and get acclimated. I think May would be problematic because of how in the middle of yeah, I am not in favor of May at all. Yeah. But there are <laughs> yeah and other months. <laughs> other it has been budget and all that. It would make yeah, sense. May is a bad month because of the budget process. That is something I've heard from the other municipal um city managers and administrators is there have a budget midway stream just about approved and a whole new board comes in and everything changes. So a couple of them have actually bumped up the date that they approved their budget. They'll approve their budget in like the last week of April or first week of May or something that way the new board's kind of starting on. But at that point, you're kind of almost handicapping that new elected body. Like if they, if someone, they're really running against some issues or some big high topic and they come in the budget set, there's nothing they can, well, they could redo it, but um, it takes a process. So that's, well, I think November seems to be, uh, <laughs> and that's when people think elections happen anyways, um, mm -hmm. as well, if people are in that mindset, but we just have to make sure it's not on a like presidential or gets overshadowed by anything. That's one of the biggest problems that the people that have it in November have mm -hmm. is the presidential elections uh, overshadow. Uh, yeah, because it does it, it doesn't just, we can't just put it as part of the other ballot for, could we'd have to have, they'd have to go to two voting places. Right. Yeah. yeah some larger cities do do that, if, depending how, like maybe the city of Greenville, the larger ones can do that because they usually have their own board of elections or can work with closely with the counties, mm -hmm. but all the mid sizes, they pretty much run a completely separate election. I have an idea. <laughs> what if we put it in, October, when people are thinking about elections, but maybe not, then it's not going to bump up. We could just have the new board take effect a month later. I'm just throwing out an idea. We don't have to decide on it. Now, it those are all things that we should be thinking about. And uh, again, uh, residents, your input is also uh, important. So if you have a, a preference uh, or where you think you're more likely to go out and vote, uh, that would be helpful for us to know. I know our charter, one of the questions was when, when does, uh, some, when we annex, when is someone able to vote? And that's 30 days after annexation because they have to live in the town for 30 days. Mm -hmm. I think that really needs to change. Now, the two year for candidate, that's another story. That's something we need to talk about. Yeah, I think that 
is something we should revisit because if we annex areas, it's like, wait, now I have to wait two years, but I've lived here my whole life. That doesn't seem fair. But you haven't lived in the town your whole life. Yeah. Right, but it, now it is the town. It's the same. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, there, right now we don't have uh, that many people that we're annexing in mm -hmm. at the moment. However, as developments get um, done and people move in, the two-year candidacy may still be fine. If I moved into the town from somewhere else, I'd have to be here two years to run for office. Mm -hmm. So something to think about. Yeah, I'm, I was kind of bat, batting back and forth an idea where it, it's like, it's two years or one year, whatever we decide on, but if you're annexed into the town, it's actually that length of time at your address, if that makes sense. So like if you've been at your address for the length of time that our elections are and you're annexed in, then you can run. Yeah, like I said, it, it, it gets a little convoluted there uh, with, you know, if you, we annex and they build new housing, different, different story. It's just like coming into the town. Mm -hmm. Anybody else coming into the town, you would wait two years. Mm -hmm. Annexation is a little bit different. And <clears throat> we can look at it from that point of view, but we would have to be specific about it. Yes. And there's two comments, public comments. Um, one from Patty, which makes some good sense saying to, I think she's saying to stagger the election so that you never overturn a whole board. So that's something to think about. And then Daryl is asking what other municipalities do. Oh, Kyle's answer. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, it's usually 18 months to two years is what I've seen. Nothing past two years. We're not the only ones at two years, um, but 18 months is kind of the less, the least I've seen. And then I know uh, one thing I've talked to the mayor about it when we do the five member board that kind of helps itself um, not turn it, it makes it harder to turn over the entire board because you actually need 10 people to run to turn over the whole council um, versus three right now you have six you have a big contested election and it's been done before um, five it's a bit more and I've been looking back at some of the municipalities with five and usually they'll keep at least at least two council members will stay on during an election year. I mean, they could have some people lose, some people choose not to run and stuff like that. It all gets mixed in, but just having more members kind of helps prevent that anyways. Um, but staggering is could be a good idea as well. It's just uh, we'd have to play with possibly the term limits um, and may have to go to four years unless we want to have elections every year. Um, right. Yeah, that would be the drawback. Of that. Yeah, that's the only drawback. Right. Um, and then with four years, I know there's been some concerns from residents, well, we don't have a strong recall ability. So that may be something if we do go to four years, we may have to add a recall option um, and stuff like that. So it's, it, I mean, this is all great discussion. Yeah. So the other thing I thought we should discuss in discussing council size is council structure. Um, because I think, I don't think at our current size, it makes sense to like run a mayor and a council separate. Maybe when we're bigger, that would make sense. But I mm -hmm. also think that right now, right now, we have a council and then the mayor who kind of just runs everything in the town. And I think it would be better to distribute the power and decision-making process throughout all five people. So like you would have one person who was a treasurer, one person who um, kind of their responsibility was working with public works, another's responsibility was public safety. Um, someone else works with the administration of the town. So maybe that's the president or the council, you know, we could still call them the mayor 
if we wanted to, but they, it would be a more even distribution. And so each, um, each council member would have a task um, and a part of the government that they were helping to guide. And everyone would be doing it together, but it would be split up. It's actually a true commission form of government. Um, I just whoever's. described. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we have a hybrid uh, makeup. It's it's not commissioner makeup, but it is a strong mayor uh, or organi organized that way. It's a strong mayor. Um, so definitely consult with, uh, we'll be consult, need to consult with the legal council on the form of government and how that uh, can be good or bad, depending on the particular makeup. Because we have a very unusual setup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking down notes. So there's um, just to high, go back to highlight some of the topics we discussed, um, date of elections, structure of government, a uh, number of elected officials, um, staggered terms versus not staggered. I have one more thing if you're done. Are you still going though? Uh, did I get everything? Well, we can, I can highlight after your time. So. Um, a, a response from the public that I got <laughs> when I was running, and I don't know if this happened with you too, Janice, with the um, election, the special election and COVID was that our absentee voting procedures were sort of cumbersome. Um, people felt like, I guess they should be able to either return the ballot differently or receive the ballot differently or have a quicker process. Um, so I think that's something we should add on our list. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. I, I ran into some challenges or some comments as well regarding that. So I think we should revisit that for sure. And I think Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, the absentee ballot outlines are in the, they're not in the charter, they're in the ordinance, correct? No. Uh, oh, uh, you know, right now, I think they are in the ordinance. Okay. Yeah. Because they, the last uh, charter amendment resolutions we had were more on... Uh, etiquette and uh, details about poll watching and things like that. Okay, I'm not looking at them. So sometimes I get them used together, but I do believe you're right. They are on the ordinance, I think. The absentee ballot guides, I think. I think you're right. Cause I didn't come across them when I was reviewing the election. So that's, yeah, so just for the public. So the uh, charter is kind of like the overview, how many commissioners, when do they get elected whatnot. But then we have a, um, elections ordinance that governs more of the how the elections are conducted um so that obviously we're going to change that that's the one that has not been touched since 2001 i think the charter has been touched even longer than that um so i'll send out that um, we can definitely put a link to the elections ordinance as well but that was a discussion that we would have to have on that as well and with that the previous time that i ran had people concerned about the hours that were available for voting. And I know we have a stretched thin board and we can't do a ton of hours, but I think we should think about, or if we're doing a survey monkey or something, like what hours do most people need that availability to? Um, Daryl Ann just volunteered herself. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> to what would people have the ability to um, come, you know, even if we do, you know, do separate blocks throughout the day to give people a break. <coughs> and that's definitely a benefit of expanding the amount of election judges as well. Because like yes. so only three, they're here, they put in 12 hour day, but with five, you, you have the opportunity to take a break and whatnot too. 
Right. Because with three, they're pretty much each one has a job. The whole twelve hour. I think we're seven a.m. What are the election hours right now, Dave? Seven to nine. One p.m. to eight p.m. One p.m. Yeah, one p.m. So maybe doing a seven a.m. to to 8 p.m. or something so we have the morning crowd as well i think it would be really beneficial at least that's how i go in the morning to vote in my yeah. municipality yeah that was one of the the concerns that i also yeah ran into was just the timing of that most people didn't have you know they're already at work by the time voting occurs and by the time it ends they're just trying to rush in just to get there to vote so it's highly likely that they'll if they really want to vote they may not even be able to vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and possibly so think, procedures can help smooth that along as well, but we should look at both, I think. Yeah, and then sometimes, I mean, the, the things I, I ran into were, you know, it's it's a hassle sometimes. People don't want to just actually use that absentee val ballot, you know, it, you know, you forget to turn it in, all those things. And then the questions were, well, if you just open earlier, I could get there before I go to work and I wouldn't have to do all that. So it makes a lot of sense for us to just to be able to accommodate, you know, the residents. And I bet the election board knows slow times versus the fast times um, of the day. So they could maybe shut down for two, two hour blocks or something like that too, as an option. Okay, any other questions or comments? Again, if you have anything that you would like to add or any questions you have, you can always contact the town hall. Did we want to uh, possibly think about putting a, um, a goodness, I'm sorry. I'm a survey monkey? Uh, well, a survey monkey as well, but possibly scheduling a uh, public forum. Um, I at the July to just to get the conversation keep going. Um, okay. uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I see it says potential timeline because I'm already thinking we're okay. in July. Yeah, I think we should have a public forum and Absolutely. We advertise what we're talking about. <coughs> um, I'm almost wondering if we should, I was kind of like, should we do it in like a outside and like really give, but it would be hard to do it like that. Okay, we have got some big tents. Um, mm -hmm. uh, did we want to do it at the July time? Meeting? Do we want to pick another date in July to do it? Maybe give people a bit Maybe more Maybe we should do it separate from the town meeting. Mm -hmm. I think so too. As, as opposed to having a part of the town meeting, have a uh, public forum on, on this on a separate date. I think that makes sense. Yeah, that sounds good. We could do both. We could put out a survey monkey if they want to rename and remain anonymous and don't want to come to the forum. But if yeah. they want to come out and have the discussion, there's the forum option as well. Um, and we could do that in later July. That would give opportunity for people to get the landings newsletter. Um, I could draft mm -hmm. something. But we don't have to put too much information out as right now. We just put the, I could pull the uh, current charter sections and the election ordinance up on the website fresh as a new posting. Um, and it, we could have some copies available at the town hall and it's put in the landings newsletter that goes out in addition to next door and social media that um, we're open in conversation, information on our website, pick up a packet at town hall and then come to the forum or fill out the survey monkey. Kyle, is events doing a movie night in July? Uh, not July, August, the second Saturday in August. Yeah. I was going to try and <laughs> town residents tape that Merge would be a good way to get turnout. <laughs> <laughs> Treat them to a movie too. Okay, uh, I think that's what uh, it sounds like a plan of attack here as far as getting this accomplished. We can come up with a, a, a time frame as far as a date other than the normal uh, town meeting or work session. And we will post that and keep everyone aware of it. And Kyle, I can put my smaller things as comments in that document you shared with us, is that right? Yeah, and we're, I'm probably gonna be expanding that document. Um, and just for publics know we have a, uh, a Word, shareable Word doc um, with the commissioners just so they can put their thoughts in. And that's obviously always made public when we do that. 
um, once all the comments are done, we include it. So that's just their inner thoughts. And that way we're not sitting in a meeting and they're saying in paragraphs three, we need to strike this. <laughs> Sounds um, like you did that for like a purpose, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So we'll be adding other sections to that as well. Or if you see any other sections in the charter, uh, commissioner is more likely to copy and paste that in there as well. Okay, any other questions or comments on this particular topic? Hearing none, we will go on to we do have Greenwell on. Now. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot that we passed them over. Are they are online now or on? There we go. Hey, Ivan, are you on? Ivan, you there? I see his name. Oh. He, he's muted. As the icon's a phone. He's only by phone. I'm texting him. Okay. If, if, are we sure that Ivan? Yeah, he did text me saying he's on. So I just text him back. If I can just add something for the commissioner's consideration, uh, the, the clerks association works hard on elections and they've held forums in the past, um, not just the clerks, but uh, the public as well. The Rockville, uh, city of Rockville, uh, did some extensive work with election forums and taking in all kinds of information, what works, what doesn't, so forth. Um, they can be a good resource of information on the subject. Okay, thank you, Dave. Dave made me think we should probably have the elections board kind of just give, I know they're not necessarily on here, but maybe they can send us or meet with us at some point. The town's supervisors of elections or the counties? Ours, you know. Um, yeah. Okay. Can't remember, but. <laughs> yeah, it's a, the name is just board of supervisors of elections. It's kind of long. We were going to put a call out for more of them because we're losing uh, Ellen's story. Uh, the stories are moving. Um, so we were going to, I was talking to Dave about putting a call out for, for new people anyways. And if we get five people, that could be great as well. Um, Ivan, are you there? I don't want to skip. You have to let me on. He's on. Hold on. Let me see. Hi, Kyle and everyone. This is Angie from Census Gap. So he's having a hard time connecting. I think he's, thanks, Angie. I think uh, he's coming on now. Coming on now. I see two okay. Ivans. Uh -oh. oh, there's a new Ivan coming. Okay. Oh, they're both connecting. Okay. Thank you. Ivan. <laughs> Hello, welcome. welcome. We've had some bad storms here, so uh, things are not well. Internet's going in and out, but I apologize, certainly. Um, and thank you for uh, kind of bearing with me on this. So um, I'll get right to it. So we have with us uh, Angie Kreiner from, from Gatso. Uh, and the the purpose of her speaking with, with the town and, and commissioners uh, and staff is, um, you know, Census Gatso is very interested in renewing a relationship with the, with the town of Up Marlboro. Um, I would say, you know, Census 
uh, Gatso was very involved along with the town in putting forth what, what is known in Annapolis as the town of Upper Marlboro legislation, which, you know, allows, which allow other counties and, and also, uh, I'm sorry, other municipalities and, and also counties to piggyback on the legislation where you're not having to go through the state uh, highway administration to implement, you know, some of the safety enforcement, automated enforcement throughout the county. Now you're just dealing with local, which is very, uh, you know, which was very time consuming. Uh, and that was all born by Census Gatso first introduction to the town of Up Marlboro and State Highway coming back to the town of Up Marlboro saying that we really did not qualify to put automated enforcement to for the safety of the citizens there. So uh, Angie and Census Gatso would, would, you know, wanted to speak to you just to, to chat a little bit about uh, for some of the newer folks about who they are and what they have to offer to the town of Up Marlboro. So with that, I will turn it over to to Angie. Thank you all. Now I'm starting to have issues. I want to turn my camera back on and it doesn't want to, oh, there we go. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for this time to speak briefly to those who are not familiar with Census Gatso. Um, Census Gatso has been in business um, roughly about 60 years. We have one camera that has been in place for about 30. So the technology here um, works extremely well. I've had the opportunity of being in the industry for about 11 years now. I started with when the legislation first passed in 2009. Um, what I do like about this firm and being a part of this team is it's a really hands-on um, back office. It all, we offer tons of reporting right at your fingertips. It's not something um, that a lot of the other vendors have where you have to reach out for reports and there's a lot of opportunity for some human contamination with data. Um, our back office is not that. Everything is right at your fingertips. How many citations, who approved, you know, what came in, what was paid, what was thrown out. So I, again, um, definitely stand behind this firm as well as the technology that has been proven throughout. Um, we do currently have two municipalities in Prince George's County. We have Forest Heights as well as Mount Rainier. And Kyle, I can provide you with some data that we have collected since we've started and since they've transitioned over to us as their vendor. And you will see it is, it, it's significant. Um, a lot of times the cameras, um, after they've been in a spot for a while, begins to change driver's behavior. However, um, with the new legislation, as Ivan was saying, we are now able to implement cameras in residential areas. So a lot of good things happening. So again, I know that there were others that you all may have talked to or spoke with prior to me coming aboard, but I have again worked in the county for some time and understand you know, how the municipalities work and exactly what you all are looking for. Um, I would be the representative locally for the area. Um, census is based in Boston, but I'm here in the Maryland area. So in a nutshell, yeah, that's what we have to offer. So I'm open for any questions or- okay, any questions for Angie or for Ivan at this or for Ivan? Um, Mayor, okay. may I say a couple of words again, please? Certainly. So, uh, Angie, can you speak to um, what we would be looking to negotiate with Up Marlboro about the law enforcement equipment fund? Absolutely. Sure. Um, when we spoke some time ago, um, Ivan and I did speak with our um, team internally. And we are looking to offer 75,000 towards police um, equipment rental and how we would desire to disperse those funds would be 30 days after um, the contract has been in place for some time and we start collecting 
um, proceeds from the camera that we would then um, do some type of percentage that would, some we would negotiate and work out, but we would collect those proceeds as the, as revenue begins to come into the town. So that is definitely something that we will be willing to do to help the town offset that cost of that equipment. So the town would be able to, thank you, Angie, uh -huh. um, for your presentation. Would the town be able to use those or law enforcement be able to use those proceeds as they wish or would it be dedicated to a certain type of equipment um, that they could apply that those monies to? It would be as you wish. I think when our initial conversation was for equipment, but it would be at the town's discretion. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I just wanna say thank you for being here and presenting to us. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm happy to be back. I stepped out of the industry for some time, but I just love this area. I, I just enjoy it, I, I, I really do. It was great being a part of it from the beginning and to see how it's grown and how things have changed is, is just amazing. I, I don't necessarily have a question, but I'd like to, I'm not sure if this is more of an observation, but I wanted to put it forth. In all the experience I've had in the 14 years with the town with uh, citations, mm -hmm. um, I've noticed, yes, there are repeat offenders. They're usually part of the workforce mm -hmm. that are downtown. However, the large, large percentage, they're always new plates. Yes. You know, that's because they're coming from all over to the court. And that made me think when you said you were working with Mount Rainier, mm -hmm. which is so close to the Hyattsville courthouse, mm -hmm. that if, if maybe their stats reflect that they didn't really go down in their revenues because of people's behavior has been changed. I, I imagine the definitely the residents' behaviors. <laughs> yeah, the resident. oh, absolutely. <laughs> Yes. And they come into the town and express that. Uh -huh, <laughs> like, yeah, but yeah, I, I'm just I, I, absolutely. if it's like in these court communities, right? Do those cameras do better as far as higher revenue consistently, as opposed to the dark Absolutely, with the technology, and in addition to the technology, we do have um, access to. Um, kind of go after these out-of-state plates as well as outside collections to make sure that we're collecting on these plates, even if they are out-of-state or collecting on outstanding citations. So absolutely, we don't discriminate. <laughs> Thank you. If you violate it, we, we, we're going to find you and we're going to collect on it. Thank I you. had a quick quote. Oh, sorry, oh. go ahead. Right. I was just going to say, I think Dave's point makes it more important for us as a commission to think about how we allocate those funds. I know we're on county roadways, but we should think about dedicating some of those funds for long-term structural changes in the roads that will fundamentally sow traffic. Because while we like the revenue, yeah. we're most concerned about the safety of our Oh, roads. absolutely. Oh, no doubt. A a absolutely. And, and again, those funds can be allocated as long as it's, you know, for safety purposes, then by all means, because the state is looking for you to use those funds because if you don't use it, you don't want it, you know, the state saying, hey, we'll take it. So absolutely, by all means, use it for safety. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask, what is the collection success rate? It's actually pretty high. Um, on a percentage wise, and each, each municipality or town is a little bit different. But we're at maybe I would say about a good uh, fifty-seven to sixty percent. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's it's pretty good. And we work very closely with the agency that we use. Um, we provide them with monthly reporting, so it's it's definitely constant um, efforts to collect on anything that's outstanding. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And, uh, Angie and Ivan, I had a question for both of you. Either one can chime in. I was just curious if during all the, the police reform discussions, if the state ever came to the discussion of how like speed and red light cameras and possibly other cameras, I think we've heard about distracted driving cameras mm -hmm. in the future, lessening like 
officer engagement and traffic stops and whatnot. Um, was that ever brought up at the state? Like when they talk about that, I've heard pushback on automated speed um, during some, but I didn't know if that was ever a benefit that was discussed. Yes, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, during the Annapolis session, there was a lot of talk about uh, implementing new technologies to lessen the police engagement, because the studies are saying that that's when, you know, uh, tensions rise and, you know, just bad things happen when, when you're doing the traffic stops. So that is something that is going to be coming down the pike, I would anticipate in the next year or two. They'll be looking at that. I know they're looking at some of the newer technologies about, uh, you know, uh, I think actually Gatso was involved in that also about you would set up a camera on, on say 495 and as Ivan Lanier is rolling down 495, I get off of the exit, it automatically says Ivan Lanier was traveling at 75 miles an hour, taking that exit. And I know they're doing that and Angie can speak to her. They're doing that over in Europe now yes. on a number of highways. And it's becoming, you know, you talk about modifying behavior, uh, but look for uh, distracted driving, uh, look for some agencies uh, creating another agency within the police agency that will mainly deal with kind of a uh, little bit less, uh, you know, partnering or a little bit less interaction with the public. Right. Um, so you may have more of the parking authority getting a little bit more uh, influence in, in everyday operations and taking it out of the law enforcement. They're finding out that the weapon is, and that's just the presence of that police officer a lot of times is, is causing a, a kind of rise in tensions here. So uh, they're, they're looking at a lot of things, um, doing a general assembly, and I think police reform is just starting. And I say that as a you know retired cop from Prince George's, uh, it's a long time coming, and and I think you know we're better off as society and following those trends. Do we have? By the way, do we have body cameras in the town? Uh, we did, and then that. we did. Bala Chief talk about that. Okay, all right. That's all. Because that that is something that is certainly we need to look at that expense. Uh, the biggest expense when you talk about body cam is not the actual equipment that the office is wearing, but it's, it's the data in the cloud. Um, so I know a lot of agencies are, are looking at that. And I know Prince George's, I think they're trying to make it very mandatory because they were in a uh, extended pilot program and they're trying to make that mandatory. So the things that, uh, you know, I, I, not only is it partner with with census gatso on the on the automated enforcement and the safety aspects of it i think they will bring a lot more to the table in the upcoming trends absolutely so to answer your question is not at this time we are looking to move forward with that in the near future so yes okay true. okay and and chief are we going to be looking at getting some state funding for that also? Yes. When, when that time comes, um, we have some other internal things we need to work out, so. Okay, great, great. But certainly when that, when that happens, certainly um, we should definitely communicate that because they are gonna establish a pot of funding to assist smaller municipalities to offset that cost. And so we want to make sure that we're involved in those discussions. Hey, does anyone else have any questions for Angie regarding the red light and speed, uh, speed camera? So if I may, Mayor, so, so Angie, mm -hmm. if we were to move forward, if the town agrees to move forward with you, how quickly can you be up and running, you know, we, we certainly understand on the data with this, the, the school crossings uh, and the seniors complaining about the speeders. So what is the typical time frame for that? Typical time frame is, is anywhere from 30 to about 45 days. We do have smaller units that are battery operated that we could place any fixed um, locations would take a little bit longer, but 
we could drop a camera fairly, fairly quickly, fairly quickly that is battery operated. Okay. But 30 to 45 days for a fixed camera. If it's a fixed camera, because we would have to go through Pepco and get the pole installed, so on and so forth. Will that, can you put that information in your proposal too, so we have that? Anything? Mayor? Mayor Bernoyer? Yes. Let me just add to that. If you're talking about speed cameras, uh, you cannot, a municipality can, may not operate speed cameras unless it has a ordinance passed and in effect. And it has to be passed in a normal course of affairs. Yeah. So that will take you at least 60 days. Yeah. And then you have to post signage mm -hmm. or I believe the statute under section 21-809 yeah. of the transportation article requires uh, a period of time. I think it's uh, 21 days. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of wickets that have to be negotiated before you deploy a speed camera yes. under the state law. Absolutely. Uh, it's much more onerous than say red light cameras, mm -hmm. uh, which don't have all the procedural requirements of speed cameras in Maryland. Very true, yep. after the ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Bess. Great to see you. Sure. <laughs> and uh, Kevin, the town does have an existing ordinance in place for 725 and I believe Old Crane Highway as well that was passed, but they just weren't approved by state highway. Um, so now that this new state legislation is in place, that old ordinance, or the, I get this not old, it's current, the current ordinance could still stand for that location at least? Uh, well, if the location is the same as what it had been previously under uh, Mayor Tonga Turner, uh, maybe so. But uh, if the, uh, um, and I know under the new legislation passed by the General Assembly, what they've done is they've expanded the use of speed cameras from school zones to residential zones. Right. And so uh, it may need to look at the ordinance to see if the language on the school zone needs to be tweaked to a residential zone, which would still require, it may not require all the heavy lifting of all the various provisions of such an ordinance, but still require passage of a new ordinance perhaps. But you'll, once you're all ready to pull the trigger on that, you want to let me know and I can review the ordinance to make sure it's legally sufficient. Absolutely. And we'd probably have to add the new areas and the newly annexed areas would have to get a new ordinance as well. But that's a good point. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for Angie regarding this? We thank you, Angie. You thank you so much. I appreciate it. Great to see you all again and looking forward to working with you all and hearing from you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, thanks, Angie. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving along, uh, we will Mr. Lanier talk to us about county initiatives. Uh, yes. And Kyle, did you want to just kind of go down the list for me? There? Sure. Yeah. Um, absolutely. So uh, there's been a couple items that um, we've been working with Greenwell on in regards to uh, the county specifically, and then also the state. Um, so I can definitely break them out. Um, one of the big, or one of the ones is the acquisition of the old stone building. Um, on the county surplus list. Um, that's actually kind of a low priority for the town. Well, we'd love to get it, but we don't have the funding to rehab it at this moment because we did switch the bond bill up and gear it toward the parking lot of um, Pocket Park. Um, but I know Ivan and his team are in communication with the county council about adding it, maybe not this year, but at next year's um, surplus. Correct, Ivan? Yes, correct. We've, we've been talking to... Councilman Harrison and his chief of staff, Eric Bowman. Um, you know, they really, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on another uh, topic, but they really like the direction that Upper Marlboro is, is, is headed. Uh, as, I, as I told, you know, Kyle earlier, 
they feel that Upmar Road being very transparent, um, and which I said we've always have been, but they just never paid attention to it. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, Upper Marlboro is being a lot more visible, uh, and he's a lot more in tune with what is happening in the town, uh, which is very good. So a lot of very very positive comments uh, about the town of Upper Marlboro. So uh, in relationship to the uh, to the old stone building. Um, you know, all I can basically say is that they were, were certainly going to consider putting that back on, contacting central services and putting back, putting that back on the surplus list. So Kyle and I are going to be working on that. You know, as, as everyone knows, everyone's still trying to get their legs, get their legs under them because of the, the pandemic. Um, but uh, all good signs coming from the council. I know we've also talked about possibly, or you've mentioned too, about possibly acquiring a uh, part of the schoolhouse pond as well. Did you say that maybe? What was the last? The schoolhouse pond, the pond downtown. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that was, you know, that was one of the things I think as your, you know, as your representative, we should really discuss um, and trying to, you know, I mean, for the events that you're having, the wonderful events that you're you're having with the community there, I think it's only a natural, uh, you know, natural fit that we go after that pond there uh, and work with Senator Peters uh, and try and also try and get you know funding for the cleanup of that pond. I, I, you know, it's it's there. It's not being really properly cared for. Uh, there's probably a lot of environmental issues that have to be you know remediated there. And I think it would be, you know, great to have that uh, kind of, you know, given to the town so that you can continue to, you know, you can have your, your movie nights that you're having there and many other things there. I think it's, it should be in the town. So this is a, another great opportunity to request uh, that the town, I think that's Park, is that Maryland National? It's split. Um, so the county owns the board, the uh, that statue area with the large boardwalk up front. Right. Um, but Park and Planning owns the land um, toward Darnell's Chance and part of it. So okay. I think Park and Planning they do an okay job maintaining their section, but it's like that main um, the picnic table area and that big boardwalk. That's the county owned property with a fountain that doesn't work. Um, that. Park and planning can't maintain because they don't physically own it. They just maintain the boardwalk itself. So if we can get the county park portion and do an MOU with park and planning on upkeep of the, the overall property, but we're still able to fund some improvements or get state grants for it, I think that'd be great um, because obviously the county is looking at a whole county. It's hard for them to focus in on mm -hmm. just that one mm -hmm. pond. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a huge, a lot of people <laughs> use that pond. Um, so if we can definitely clean it up and get it to the a scope even more people could use as well we could do fishing rodeos you know what i mean there's mm -hmm. just there's just so much we could do there yeah and i'm not sure what kind of agreement whether or not the county would you know since they're they're transitioning out to the other building whether or not they would completely give that to us or we'd have to come up and you know, we'd have to talk to you know probably kevin about that come up talk some kind of arrangement where we're kind of partners in that uh and then maybe after so many years that you know, goes back to the town as their property. So that's something that we really should explore on that. And I, I personally don't think the county is really, you know, I don't think they're wedded to hanging on to that, their portion of that property. Um, but again, that's something that we should definitely explore and move forward with too. I think we but have yeah, to offer. That sorry. would come with Senator Pete herself. I'm sorry, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's also, we have to consider the liability issue. That's, cur there's a current issue <laughs> because okay. it, of the back of the pond, there's like a real safety issue with the mud and the path. Um, so it's just something, I mean, obviously a pond has issues, but um, I'm just pointing that out. I don't know if everyone goes back there or not, but. That's the park and planning owned section. That's why I want them to keep it. <laughs> oh, okay. That's a, and that's towards the rear of the pond there? Mm -hmm. It really needs to just be redone with wood pilings for the whole way around. But that's okay. just my opinion. 
especially now that the pond's filled with water, the water is coming pretty close to that asphalt path there. And there's big piles of the big sediment pond. that they move all around. It's it's a mess. Mm -hmm. right there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll put some thoughts together on on some like kind of partnerships that have gone on in a general assembly along with the grants. And then I'll shoot those to you, Kyle, and you kind of take a look at that. Uh, one in particular that comes to mind is, is what they did with the, with green, uh, not green belt, with uh, buoy and the old racetrack area. Mm. Um, and I think after, I think it's maybe 10 or 15 years that, that goes to the city of Bowie. So there, there are some different dynamics or different partnerships that you can kind of put together in order to either jointly, you know, own or take control of that, that pond. If you're willing to put the money into the maintenance that, or if there's a dedicated fund that goes to maintenance that from the state, which could be from the Maryland Department of the Environment, or Department of Natural Resources, or sometimes Maryland National Capital Park and Planning will kind of continually fund the town of Upper Marlboro to take care of that pond, you know, kind of get it off their plate. So there's some innovative ways, you know, many people forget that the actual Bowie Bay Sox is on Maryland Capital. That's owned by Maryland, the stadium is owned by Maryland Capital Park and Planning. And it's just a long-term lease. So the funding actually comes to uh, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning uh, and then goes kind of through Bowie and then goes to the Bowie Bay Sox uh, baseball team. So we, we can be creative on that. Um, and then also we have uh, two pots of money um, earmarked for the town of Up Marlboro in the county budget. Um, one is $100,000 in the uh, public work, county public works budget for beautification of Main Street. Um, that's something we started up. That's for like benches, some uh, sidewalk improvement, fixing some of the sidewalk areas that are cracked, um, installation of trash and recycling bins, some planners, um, just that general beautification push. Um, and so that's been in the budget for the past two years. It got put in um, right before COVID, then COVID hit, so we haven't had a chance to work with it. Um, but the town's currently working with the state um, because of most of the work would be along Main Street 725 or a Water Street, um, Maryland Route 717. So we're working pretty much the county said just get the, the clearance from State Highway because it's their roads to do the work and then we can issue out the money. Um, so I'm just working with State Highway now to get some of those um, uh, right away permits done and approved. Um, for installation benches, there's the area at Main and Water with the broken kind of concrete area next to the uh, FedEx and UPS box right there. Turn that into a nice little area. Turn the bus stops into actual bus stops with shelters. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just little things like that um, that I'll bring before the board again because we brought before an older board pre-COVID. So it's time to kind of dust that off and get going. But the county did include it in the, the its current budget again, which is great. Yeah, yeah. And, and while it's in that budget, we certainly want to, you know, kind of trigger that and get moving on that um, before, you know, they look for some fundings and maybe reprogram it to another municipality. I don't think that'll happen because, you know, they, I think all the counties just got their uh, American recovery uh, funding. I think it was Friday or so. I think they're pretty happy right now, but um, we should we should move on that. Absolutely. Um, and then the second pot of money is the $2.5 million for downtown redevelopment. It's, it's rather vague. Uh, <laughs> um, right, right. And so, so I think we can be pretty creative with its use. We just have, we have to have a good plan in place, correct, Ivan, to, for them to free that up. And it's, that's in the re redevelopment authorities budget. It, it has been, it's been, it's been in budget since 2014. Uh, uh, which is amazing. Uh, they cannot move it um, and reprogram it. So it's, it's in there for economic development for the town of Up Marlboro. Um, I believe they were also looking at that when they were looking at what they were going to do with Showplace Arena, mm -hmm. since we have now annexed that whole area. Uh, but we need to have that conversation with, with uh, Councilman Harrison to see if he can free that money up. 
you know, you, we certainly have the economic development plan in place. You know, it's certainly needed within a town. So it's just a matter of getting them to, to you know, to pull that trigger on that 2.5 million. It's interesting that it's been there for so long and they haven't, and it, it's not only us, there's some other municipalities that are under the same constraints, um, but it's, it's getting them to move forward on that. My suggestion is that we reach out to uh, the new council president, uh, you know, Hawkins, Calvin Hawkins, who's a little bit, uh, a little bit more, you know, on the, to the left and see if we can get him to pull the trigger on this and, and release that 2.5. Um, so I think we do have to dust off, I think uh, we talked about it, dust off our plan on what we're gonna do that 2.5. Um, but I think Calvin Hawkins, while he's, while he's president, I, I think we'll look favorable at, at trying to move, if not all of it, a portion of it, you know, back, back to the town. So now is now is the time. I think it was put there, Mayor. You were there by Council uh, or Sharon Baker, I believe. Yeah. Um, and it's just it's it's an interesting story on that. So they've kind of they've kind of kept it in the budget because it has to be in a budget. And every year it's it's passed. It's never removed. And all we have to do is is get it pushed forward. I know there was a conversation that I had with with. With the councilman, and he has indicated that he had a preference for whatever we use that 2.5, um, that we would look at affordable housing. So that is something that, if you, you know, your commissioners, if you want to kind of take that into consideration, that was one of the things he did say um, on our plans, whether or not there were any affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And that was the one piece that, as we annex that showplace arena, and as that big development that was going there, he had mentioned it would be great if the developer, and I think he's making it a requisite that that developer adds affordable housing. So that might be a way to get them to move off our 2.5 also. I'm not sure if we have the property um, in order, you know, or a footprint for that. Um, but, you know, that, that seems to be where the councilman's heart is, getting some affordable housing. There's that lot that needs to be redeveloped too. Kind of which you... which which lot was that, Commissioner? Where Al's was, mm -hmm. we can what we can kind of try to steer someone who develops that into having housing above, kind of mix a mixed use development with housing above. I think that's how it was before. That's it just awesome. wasn't legal housing, yes. but yeah. So hopefully now it'll be legal housing. <laughs> Um, legal housing. Okay. <laughs> the, the plan is to have legal housing. Replace it with the same, but with legal housing. Have that maybe be affordable. And I think there's a lot of opportunities downtown for pop. There's kind of there's housing downtown, but it's just not fully legal. And maybe partnering with those property owners to to bring it up to code, spruce up the building. Because when we do talk to developers, that's the big thing they want to see in Main Street is like the bottom floor commercial, then top floor people living there, because that's who's mm -hmm. going to patronize those shops. Um, so I think that's a great model for especially a, a Main Street community. Yeah, yeah. And maybe we should look very closely at that. And, and again, I'll, I'll speak to him on that, um, you know, after, you know, the internal discussions that the town has. So Kyle, just, you know, just ping me and let me know if you want me to, to bring that up um, with the councilman about we're looking at, you know, the mixed use kind of affordable housing and things of that nature. And downtown is zoned for mixed use. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the last, or no, I'm sorry, there are two more things we talked sure. we've been talking about with the county. One is uh, the possible redistricting of the, uh, the county council representation, and then our possible partnership with the revenue authority or the two other things. I yeah, the, the redistricting, um, you may go into and I get the, the districts confused. You may go into uh, Councilman district. Derek Davis uh, district, um, but again, he is term limited. Um, so we're, we're not sure who's going who's gonna to take his place. Um, and the council was still kind of kicking that around. Um, 
so we may have a new we may have a new councilman or it may <laughs> it may remain the same so you know again nothing has come out nothing has come out concrete from the Prince George's County Council um, but that is up this year um, so we will we'll we'll keep an eye on on that for you because right now the town's in district nine only, but once phase two and three annexation kick in, we'll be in yeah. district nine and six because the right. town limit borders to the north and uh, east are actually the borders for the council member districts. Um, yeah. So I know that's something the county's talking about. They don't want municipalities split up because now we got four count. We have the two at large and then we'll have two county council members. We have a large majority of the county council and can kind of have that influence or Potentially, I guess I could see their issues with that. They want to keep each municipality in one council district. Absolutely. They, yeah, they, they certainly, the conversation is they want, you know, the municipalities within one councilmatic district. And obviously that because of, you know, each councilman gets a certain amount of funding and such. And so that would make it, you know, very, very difficult. And it used to be where they were splitting the districts. Um, and then actually Bowie, is the one that precipitated this because Bowie <laughs> continued to grow. And, and as they grow in Annex, they were crossing in different councilmatic districts. So it created a problem. So they decided, you know, we need to stop the, the well, Derek Davis says, the growth of the Bowie empire. Uh, <laughs> um, so you had District Heights uh, and then you had Bowie that were basically becoming the largest, almost the largest municipalities in the county. So they wanted to create that that buffer so that each councilman was responsible for his own district. So um, we're not sure. My, if I had to take a guess, I think we were going to be going with um, N6. Um, but we will, we will certainly let you know when they come out with, you know, the full, full answer. And I think what they're waiting on also is that the state is doing their redistricting also. So the delegates and the senators may change. I think we won't, I think we'll still be under uh, Senator Peters, um, but I think there will be some other, you know, changes in legislative districts here. Okay. And we're also beginning some talks with Revenue Authority about parking enforcement and a possible parking garage downtown to help with the, the parking issue. Um, but that's, I think, Pretty new still. Um, we are. They're 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 eager uh, to talk to the town about a partnership. Um, I thought they would immediately say no, but they did not. Um, so they are ready to to speak with us on how that partnership would work. Uh, the revenue authority has been very aggressive uh, in in new projects. Uh, they actually did a office building in Mount Rainier and the way they, they finance the office, the office building with the developer. And then after, you know, they did a, a low interest loan to that developer. And then after five years, he owned it. So, and that is the revenue authority. So they're really, uh, you know, doing a lot of economic development. So when I spoke to, uh, Calvin Brown, who is the CFO over there, he mentioned that they were looking for projects and, and certainly this may be, you know, kind of a win-win for them in the town of Upper Marlboro because, you know, there's that, you know, they have to hire so many employees for that one particular, I think is Water Street right there. And the revenue would be so much better. And not only that, it's gonna bring a lot of additional parking to the court system that's been crying for addition for a parking structure for the last 10 years. So I think, you know, they're ready. Uh, I think we're going to set that up within the next couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, I just sent over some uh, talking points to Ivan. I'll, I can forward that out to the board as well. Um, yep. So just, we are, we are ready to go. Um, so Let we'll see just... what that split is, we'll, you know. Um, and I think what they will do, the, the revenue authority will kind of do the engineering. They will, they will kind of do all of that, um, all of the pre-work. Uh, and then we would, you know, either, either kick in a pot of money, you know, allocate some of our funding to it. 
um, or we could sit back and just do a revenue share agreement with them and we would do the enforcement for them and get a share of the revenue. But all the preliminary work would be done by the revenue authority. And I think what we would want to do is make sure aesthetically it is, you know, right for the town so that you're not having just a, you know, a brick structure there um, and make sure, you know, it fits the town's character. So that was the one thing I would suggest we make sure in any MOU that we're working with that that's in there, that we have first right of approval on that or we would pick that. Mayor, uh, if I may. Yes, go ahead, Kevin. I, I would just point point out that um, parking is a very delicate matter uh, between the county and the town. And if you're going to enter into some sort of agreement with the revenue authority, don't forget that there is an existing MOU with the county slash revenue authority. You need to look at that and how, what ramifications there will be on that. Now, I guess four-year-old agreement uh, as you're going forward, because that document needs to be cared for and possibly amended uh, as you go forward with the project that you're mentioning. Hmm. Okay. No, Kevin, that's that's interesting because I, I forgot about that. So that, if I may, so that MOU that we currently have with them, can that be expanded if we were doing that? Or is it just kind of for one particular you know, it's been a long time since I've looked at it, since the litigation matter arose and that was settled by that MOU, but uh, I imagine it would be, it would need to be amended in some way, shape, or form. That, um, that agreement called for all street parking on public streets to, to be turned over to the town, um, and I think the areas we're talking about are off-street parking lots. So I don't know if, would we amend that, Kevin, or, or would we have the new MOU would still stand because it wouldn't conflict with the, the on-street parking segment? I'm, I'm not sure entirely that the scope of uh, parking agreements is vested only in that one agreement, but uh, it may be, it may, it may be a completely separate agreement, but certainly uh, someone needs to look at that MOU to make sure it's, uh, it's not problematic to enter in, either enter into a new MOU or whether there's a necessity to amend that existing MOU. Mm -hmm. So Mayor, if, may I ask Kevin yes. just one more question? So, Go right ahead. So Kevin, if, if there were, would the town, is the town able to enter into an agreement with a private entity, you know, say if Revenue Authority said that the, the town input would be you know, two million dollars on the structure. Can you enter into kind of a private-public partnership on that? Absolutely, but it sounds to me that um, the revenue authority is giving up some of its uh, either its fee simple own property or uh, okay. its structures and buildings. You know, the town needs to have some sort of easement or. Uh, use agreement with the revenue authority for that uh, to take over what I guess is parking spaces or parking areas. I, I really, I'm not really fully understanding the scope of uh, what's being proposed. So I'm, I'm just bringing it to your attention. You wanna take a look mm -hmm. at that existing MOU to make sure that that doesn't cause a problem uh, moving forward with the revenue authority. Um, so if I, May I suggest that once we do the meeting that we have Kevin in that meeting with the Revenue Authority? Yes, that would probably be a very good idea. Okay. And I'll, I can forward my talking points that I sent to him and the board as well. Um, it gives a good overview of, of how, of what we're thinking about. Okay. All right. Okay. Anything else on the county initiatives, Kyle? Uh, that's all I had. I don't know if the commissioners or Ivan or anyone else had any other input of any other initiatives. Um, we should we could have obviously there's some stuff in stronger relations as well um, before we move on to the state part. But. 
Yeah, I think my questions are more under stronger relationships. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ivan, did you want to say anything about the state initiatives yet? You know, what we could be thinking about uh, as far as uh, come September? Yeah, one of, the, one of the things we, we talked about, um, and I was talking to Senator Peters about it and other members of the delegation was um, uh, a year or so ago, Senator Peters had, uh, there are two things he thought about. Uh, one, that he has, I guess it's a passion. Um, he loves, you know, and, and Commissioner Franklin, it actually goes to what you're saying, building strong relations. Um, we, we are, you know, he loves the town of Up Marlboro, which is fantastic as you can tell by the amount, what he's doing with the town as far as appropriations. Uh, so we need to keep continually building that up. Um, you know, Commissioner Franklin you, you, and Mayor and others, you testify uh, on the bill and believe it or not on the, on the speed legislation, believe it or not, Senator Peters was quietly behind that bill, making sure that bill was being pushed to primarily because of the town of Upper Marlboro and, and the safety of its citizens. So I, I thank you all for, you know, for taking the time to do that. Um, but what Senator Peters, the, the two things that uh, he spoke to me about was one, uh, he's always wanted to, wanted the town to consider a splash pad. Um, and so, you know, we probably need to consider that. And I believe he was, he was, Pretty interested in, in, in allocating, I think it was 75,000 or something like that, Kyle, I can't remember the act number for the splash pad. Um, and he thought it would be very beneficial, you know, for the children in the town of Upper Marlboro. So a splash pad or, you know, water park or whatever it is you would call it, um, I, I, would, I would urge you to kind of take a look at that and see if we want to get some appropriations for that. And then his second, um, his second, I guess, what he'd like to see is um, the next time you're annexing, um, he wants you to obtain the old Upper Marlboro golf course because he feels that is the perfect park. I want that. Green too. space for you. And he said he would do whatever it takes to assist you in obtaining uh, that park property. Um, which is pretty substantial. And I think he just wants to keep it out of any kind of development, but he feels that that is, that is what the town of Up, Upper Marlboro is lacking right now, green space. And he felt that, that, that would, it's just sitting there and he, is, uh, he was involved in that and he feels that he can help us if we wanted to purchase it or, or anything in that nature. So those are, the, those are the two things that Senator Peters um, had brought up in my conversation with him. Okay. Yeah, that's one actually, when I was out campaigning in uh, Marlboro Town that several people mentioned, they like to use that area and they wanna make sure it stays, stays mm -hmm. natural, but also like, it'd be nice if it was more accessible and improved in the yeah. park way. Yeah. yeah. So those are those are the two. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Our pleasure. Uh, Commiss Commissioner Franklin, you had a question for Mr. Lanier. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so we want to build stronger relationships with the county, um, but we are frankly we are suing the county, um, and. We're suing the county to preserve a building that was a segregated school. And I feel like there's a whole lot of layers to this. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, we don't, our residents don't want to have um, the school use the they're planning, they were planning to do some kind of school for troubled youth there. Yes. Our residents don't want that there. And I'm concerned about the infrastructure capacity for that there. 
um, I just, I'd like, I'd like for us to be able to find another way to come to some sort of middle ground that meets everyone's needs. Um, maybe the school is smaller and also includes a satellite office for our police department, or maybe it's a different use. Um, mm -hmm. But right now with us suing them and them saying, no, we're putting this here, we can't even have that conversation. That's right. But my understanding is if we stop suing them, then they're just gonna do it without having the conversation. So I feel like it's not a strong relationship when the way you're communicating with each other um, is in court, basically. Right. Um, and and Daryl Ann makes a good point. A lot of people have mentioned wanting to see that have like arts areas or business incubators or artist studio space. Um, but yeah, so how do we, how do we kind of have these conversations so we can work together and make something productive that works for everyone's needs, including if we're going to have some youth there, including those youth and the community and kind of building a community space mm -hmm. instead of an argument in court. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. Um... I mean that's that's you know the whole the whole suit it's it's certainly the cloud that's that's hanging everyone is a little uh, you know a little kind of okay you know do we we can't talk about it uh, and so it it is there um, but let me just say that I in talking to the council folk um, you know a year two years ago you know you know mayor you know it was very contentious um, that has since dissipated. Okay, there, there are other things that are going on in, in, you know, in the county. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the council is not as, you know, the magnifying glass is not on the town of Upper Marlboro is, is suing the county, um, which is a good thing for us. So the only thing that, you know, kind of informally, you know, keep doing what you're doing, you know, um, you know, I think Kyle's doing good. We're inviting them to each and every event. Um, and that's, that's just how that works. You know, I do talk to Commissioner Harrison and, and Eric Bowman, you know, regularly, and they're always good things about Up Marlboro. Hey, Up Marlboro is doing, you know, the shredding day and Up Marlboro is doing this. And I got another invitation from Kyle. Um, and that's what I think we have to do. And I think we continue to do that. You know, we're going to, you know, continue to build these strong relationships. Um, as far as you know the you know the the building there um you know i i think we can probably have a you know a conversation after you know the adjudication <laughs> of the case um and i know kevin's on and kevin knows that but um in order to keep the lines clear um so i think once once the case is, is run its course I, I think everyone would be a little bit more comfortable in, in having a face to face, which I really think that's what has to be done. Yeah. Uh, to sit down and say, okay, all right, that that's all past us. How do we move forward? And these are our needs. And and you know, if we can't have something, you know, within the school, mm -hmm. then there's got to be another give back that they can give us to to work with our citizens of the town. Um, but again, that's. Right now we're kind of we're kind of locked in what we can do and what we can say, which makes it you know difficult. Uh, and that actually happened with the old school building, as we're talking to them, and they're like, "Well, yeah, we we love what's happening in the town, but we're not sure of the optics if we were to put that old school building back on the surplus, and we're still in court with you." Right, the stone building. So, yeah, yeah. Those, yeah. And, and, I, and I get what they're saying, you know, so that was kind of the unofficial kind of version. So um, we just have to keep, you know, we just have to keep pushing along and, and keep inviting them and making them a part, you know, of the town of Up Marlboro. And I think everything will, you know, everything will come, you know, full circle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I have an aside question. I just, um, I, 
I'm just going to get your contact information because it's totally unrelated to anything we're discussing. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. it's about like future planning and wanting to pick your brain. So no, no, absolutely, <laughs> and and certainly reach out. You know, reach out to me at any time. And okay, uh, I am I am always in the county. Okay. Um, so reach out to me anytime, and I can you know pop by and we can have that conversation on what your thoughts are on that. But um, uh, you know, I think I think all the commissioners and mayor and all everybody's doing a great job. You know, we you know we're being as transparent as we can possibly be with mm -hmm. the county, and they know exactly. Uh, I will say they get our they get our newsletters. Um, they're reading them, which is which is very good. So. Um, you know, before, you know, it would go in their inbox and they maybe didn't look at it, but now they're taking the time to read it and, and that's good for us. So uh, we'll mm -hmm. just keep keep doing the public relations piece and I think it'll all work out, you know. And Ivan, um, I did send an email over to them. We were trying to get, uh, see if they, if any of the council members, I think we reached out to Councilman Franklin Hawkins and uh, Harrison to see if they wanted to put any information in our newsletter because it reaches out to their constituents. Um, I did hear back from Senator Peters and the state delegation. They have some stuff they wanted to put in, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't hear anything back from uh, the county level. So next time you talk to them, maybe if not this issue, a future issue. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'll definitely do that. I, I think, you know, as far as what we're looking at as a town on, on our initiatives, I think we, we stay, you know, with Senator Peters and that delegation. Uh, Senator Peters is chair of the capital budget. Uh, and, and again, he's been, you know, he's been great for the town of Up Marlboro. And I think let's keep those relationships with him. Um, you know, he is the guy that, you know, all capital projects come through his committee and he has to sign off on those. Uh, and so we're in his good graces and I think we should continue to uh, speak with him. And remember, he was a, a councilman at one time. City of Bowie and the county. That's right. So yeah. he's still very, very much in, in contact with them. So he's the one that knew about the potential development at the Shield Place Arena, that site. So uh, he's very plugged into county politics. So I think by keeping, staying on his good side, we're also, that kind of transcends into you know, Councilman Harrison and all. But let's remember, they have to come to him for their capital projects on the state side. So it all kind of ties in, which I think is good for us. Let me just add something to that since the litigation matter was raised. Um, first of all, in context with it, we were, at, we were at war with the county three or four years ago. And now the county wants to increase the town's parking authority with them to partner with them even further. Mm -hmm. So certainly, you know, the county, the county is a big grown up. The municipality sh should have some teeth in what they're doing. Sometimes uh, in the state of Maryland, and I've been working with municipal corporations in the state of Maryland now for 25 years of my life, the perception is that municipalities are the redheaded stepchildren of local government. But sometimes the, the municipalities have to stand up for themselves and assert themselves. Mm -hmm. And yes, litigation is the last resort thing to do. And, you know, this is not a traditional lawsuit. This is a petition for judicial review of an agency decision. There's no monetary claims. There's no tort claims. There's no uh, real animosity involved other than getting the county to follow its own law. And... Uh, um, this case is not over. Even if we were to get a good decision at the Court of Special Appeals level, uh, the, you know, the town cannot uh, st stop or usurp zoning authority. Uh, the county is the, uh, the Park and Planning Commission and the county council are the planning authorities in the county. They're going to have to decide eventually, whether they want to go forward with this process, very likely they will. Furthermore, the town has done cases like this dealing with sexual map amendments some 10 or so years ago. So I don't think that uh, this litigation matter is a um, county municipal relations destroyer by any way, shape or form. 
fact, this town enjoys, a, a reaps a great deal from a litigation matter that went all the way to the Court of Appeals involving annexation in the town of Forest Heights, which then uh, yielded fruit for the town with the uh, annexation, its first annexation in the history of the town just a couple of years ago. So uh, yes, litigation, uh, Commissioner Franklin, is a last resort, but it's something a town as a uh, municipal corporation, a co-equal local government in the eyes of the General Assembly uh, under, under the scheme of Maryland law and the Constitution of Maryland <laughs> requires municipalities to stand up for themselves and assert their rights from time to time. Uh, so I just wanted to say that since you've raised this issue with the Academy Hill property. Yeah, I think I agree to some extent. I think just optically and sort of emotionally, we have a town that has a really unpleasant racial history fighting a lawsuit to preserve the historic building where only white people were allowed to go for an extent of time. I know it eventually became integrated. Um, so I think that really sits very wrongly with me and probably other people um, in the town. And so I think that's why a, a big part of why, and probably in the county, I feel like I wanted to evaluate it and think about it um, because obviously I don't want our current residents to suffer for our <laughs> past. But I also think we need to acknowledge what we're even though it's the only way to have any impact, we need to acknowledge that what we're doing is maybe hurtful. Well, I, I'm not sure that the fact that uh, there were racial issues or segregation that occurred on the Academy Hill property with the shells that are now the buildings, I think the town's concern is more about the skyline and the, the architectural significance, not so much the fact that there was racial issues uh, connected with the site. And oh, there's also the that. Dr. Bean site as well, who was, uh, you know, he was truly an American hero. And uh, his grave site uh, marks uh, a grave site of national significance to the entire nation. So the Academy of Health Property, uh, you know, yes, I understand the racial issues and the segregation that occurred there. But uh, you know it's complex, like most things. It's a complicated situation. It is. I just I think acknowledging that, regardless of why we're doing it, the facts of it are hurtful to people is important. Any other discussion? Any other questions for Ivan? Okay, hearing none. Thank you, Ivan. I yeah. appreciate all the information. Okay, bye bye. And we right. are going to move forward. Thank you. To FY 2022 DNR Parks and Playground. This is again a board discussion. I'll you I go over the memorandum. Absolutely. Um. So the. Every year, the uh, Department of Natural Resources of the state issues out a grant program for parks. Um, we've benefited from it twice for phase one and phase two of the community playground, um, which we're obviously still working on. Um, but they released funding opportunities for FY 2023. Now, I just wanted to have a, a chance to open up discussion with the board and see um, any initiatives you wanted me to explore or put applications in for. Um, it doesn't have to be just for one site. We can uh, do, pro you may have seen it in the application, we can do priorities. So you can be like, this is a priority, but secondary, we would like, if funds available, we'd like to fund this as well. Um, just some thoughts on it is the, the pocket park, obviously we have the bond bill to purchase the land, but we don't have uh, funding to uh, build a pocket park or design a pocket park. Um, so that's an option. And then possibly, um, I know we're meeting with Marlboro Town next month, so maybe some discussion with them. Is there anything, any parkland or anything that they'd like to improve over there? Um, and then I also put on here the splash pad 
Um, so it could kind of be phase three of the playground would be a so we'd have the two playground structures and the splash pad all on the town property there. Um, and because uh, splash pads are very, I think that'd be a very popular site there, honestly, because there's no like public pools or water parks in this part. Um, and with the Boys and Girls Club and all that being right there, they just run over there. They play on a pretty much a concrete pad with water squirting up out of the ground or dumping from above. Um, the system's on a timer. So when you approach the splash pad, you hit it and you have 10 minutes of the water moving around and it's, it's refiltered water. So we're not pulling new water and uh, you don't need a lifeguard or anything. So it's very low maintenance. Um, so splash pads are becoming very popular. Um, and it could kind of be um, symbolic in the way that even though the town hall, obviously pool was filled in, here we are reopening it again, not as a full pool again, but uh, you know what I mean? Just welcoming everyone back. Um, so those are just some ideas, but I just wanted to open it up to the board and see if, if there are any other areas you wanted to think of. Um, okay, Kyle, do, do uh, will this cover, I know we have some kind of uh, thing going with the uh, canoe and kayak uh, down by 202. Yep, so we tried that. That was actually using, it wasn't using this grant. It was using the, uh, the open space program. Um, but the thing is, it, the town has to either own the land where the park's going, or we have to have an agreement with whoever it is um, for, for this grant to go through. And that's where we ran into issues um, for that um, grant over there on 202 along the Western Branch. That property was owned by the county because of their dredging project and all that other stuff, they didn't want to improve that lot yet. Um, and with that project still kind of in limbo, um, that wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend at this time. Especially even once we annex um, any properties out there, probably wouldn't qualify for this year just because they won't be fully in the town yet. But definitely next year, annexation phase two and three, um, if there's any parks in there that we can improve or purchase vacant lots to improve parks and install parks in those new annex areas as well. Um, but that's why we couldn't do it at the Western branch. But hopefully once they do dredge it, and I know we've talked about some sort of a social justice trail or something, we could definitely tap a lot of funding from the state for that. Yeah, this uh, also allows us to develop new trails. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was my question as well. We have lots of trail ideas. And then yeah, trail walking trails are great. Um, also, I wanted to know, like, if for the splash uh, for the park, was it the splash pad, um, Kyle? Yeah. Mentioned? Yeah. If we could look at also um, incorporating, like, when we do do that, um, some type of artistic expression into that. So, I mean, I think it's great for kids to be able to, you know, see some. Some some colors, some you know, getting an artist involved with that. I think that that would just be great. I think that'd be a great spot for public art. I agree. If I mean, even, I'm even thinking maybe some tile work or something from an yes, artist, not that's just exactly what concrete. I was thinking. Yeah. Yes. And bring that up to like maybe some concrete. Yeah. I think that'd be great. Yeah. Too. I know Daryl Lynn is like shaking her head right now. <laughs> I don't see her, but I know she's probably shaking her head like yeah. yeah. <laughs> there she go brainstorm something kind of tagging on what you said was we have all these entrance areas to town mm -hmm. um, and we're going to need to move those as we annex and wouldn't it be neat if our committees each had like an entrance gateway so like there's an arts council entrance gateway and there's a green team entrance gateway so maybe you have a pollinator garden near that one or something like that or and there's a historic entry way so maybe it's sort of designed to match historic architecture. That was just a brainstorm we had and you made me think of it. So <laughs> I'm throwing it out there. Mm -hmm. That's I don't good. know if that could work with this funding though, because it's not necessarily. Yeah, well. it's not a part. We'd have to own the land. If we bought the individual lots where the signs go, because normally we just installed signs in either state or county or our right away. Um, but if we were able to purchase a lot, maybe adjacent to where an entrance would be, we could do something like that. And we could use funds for this. Um, that work. Um, when, I, when is the timeline on this grant? This is due in August. So we have um, a August. to do some research. Yeah, I was trying to bring it up before the board before. Um, 
I have a baby girl in August. So <laughs> I was trying to not meet and not hit any crazy deadlines there. Um, I think I put it on here. It's August. Um, it's on this, the, August 26th, late August. Yeah, so even after we have time. But Okay. But uh, we have some time to do a little research. And we can, Kyle, we can brainstorm too when we get the maps out and then mm -hmm. go to the communities with them too. Absolutely. And uh, what we could do, another thing I thought of is there is a vacant lot along the Western Branch. Um, and I think it's actually the location where uh, two of uh, two African Americans were actually um, hung from the old iron bridge. Um, so I don't know if we wanted to possibly look to purchase that kind of vacant. It's right yeah. along the Western Branch and possibly purchase that for the future social justice trail or something like that as well. Um, or just have something there, some sort of memorial or informational thing there. Because I think the, and Patty and Brian are on, they, I think there's still the stone structure of the bridge, um, I think is what's up there too. But that's, it's a, it's unimproved lot. I think there's a pylon. Uh, yeah, pile of stone pylons of where the old iron bridge. There. And that is an out of state owner or yeah, out of town owner. Uh, yeah, and I think the Prince George's County Lynching Memorial Project mm -hmm. um, would like to see us do a community remembrance mm -hmm. there if that's what the community, they like the community to guide it, but I yeah. think kind of something that is sensitive to the fact that there were racial terror lynchings there, um, but also remembering those people's lives, the Michael Green and Absolutely, yeah. The, the two were there on the, the bridge. Even's last name eludes me. There were actually three in town. Mm -hmm. I think two at that bridge and one at Water Street, I do believe. Yeah. And then the one was up at um, up the hill. Yeah. <sighs> um, but that's that's an option as well I can explore. Um, but it sounds like um, the board would like me to look into splash pads at the the playground location because um, mm -hmm. we could also I have to look at the matching funding requirements for uh, if Senator Peters is able to secure funding or we could work with him to just push and make sure because um, he he can put in letters of support when we do apply for these uh, playground grants as well. Um, so we can work with I'll work with Ivan and see what we can do because the, the splash pad it may be a big upfront cost but maintenance is, is pretty low on it. Um, the biggest thing will be the water hookup and the pipe system. Um, and then obviously we may just have to look at the insurance part of stuff as well, but uh, I think it's a, I think it's very feasible. Um, so the splash pad and was there something with, with public art option too, I think that'd be a good like sculpture tile spot. So we can look to the Maryland state arts council for that as well. Um, and then I didn't know if, do we still want to talk to Marlboro town, see if they had any initiatives they wanted us to try and, well, actually, I think we have a couple Maybe. of their members. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not to put them on the spot, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but we're putting you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> Monica. Um, we can sorry. talk about it when yeah. we talk about it. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> You want, you want to talk about it now? <laughs> it's up to you. You can say, let's talk about it later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can we talk about it later? I want to chit chat with the, the, the rest of the board. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Kyle. <laughs> oh, no problem. Sorry to put you on the spot. I just, yeah, it just gave me more time to look into anything if you had any ideas off the top of your head. But we, yeah, July is definitely still enough time to talk about it. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks, guys. We did lose the mayor. No, she's not. Okay. Um, but that's, that's, I just want to get some, some basic thoughts from the board and any, any public thoughts as well on that. So. I am still here. Oh, there you are. You came off camera. So I was trying to make sure we didn't lose you. Okay. Um, so we're going to do a, a bit more exploring into this. So if there are no other questions, I will call on Chief Burris to talk about the training MOU with the county police. It's up for renewal. 
So good evening, everybody. Uh, the training uh, that we have with the Prince George's County Police Department is due to expire in September of this year. Um, I actually put in a request back in April to have it extended until 2023. So uh, I had an opportunity to meet the chief uh, last week, um, kind of briefly discussed it with him. Um, he said he had heard about it. And he thought it was a good idea. So it's actually going through the uh, legal channels on their end. Um, it's the exact same agreement that we had from uh, two years ago. So the only thing that really needs to change is the date and the mayor's name and a couple of names on their end. So I know you all have that. It's uh, pretty straightforward. So if no one has any questions, that'll be it for me. Thank you. And we'll add it to the July town meeting for formal approval. If that works. Thank you, Chief. Thanks. I don't want to jump ahead of you, Mayor. Do you want me to go over? One of these items is mine and one is uh, Dave's. Um, okay, we'll go over yours. Sure. I was going to let the, the board know that we're working on the town hall op opening plan. I'll have a draft out to you guys this week. Um, it talks about in some security stuff that uh, Chief's working on, as well as just the COVID protocols, and then also the uh, the rental agreements as well. Um, so you get the board will be seeing that this week. Um, I just want to let you know that <laughs> we're working on it because July 1st is rapidly approaching. Yes, it is. And we have some time away as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, David, you have the uh, uh, all the stuff for the room rental available for the commissioners? Um, well, uh, I can email those items. Um, I did work on the agreement form uh, just eliminating any mention of uh, full facility rental or more than just your standard conference room. Mm -hmm. So there are a few items in there that I highlighted for uh, further discussion. I want to confirm uh, the contact number for the police. Uh, small things like that. Um, and actually, I don't have it up that I can look at here, but it, it involved getting rid of the uh, pictures of the whole facility, which would be our lobby, our kitchenette, and mention of the grounds. I figure if we want to deal with uh, renting out the grounds, that should be a separate thing. Uh, it, it was originally put in this rent conference room rental agreement, uh, just uh, anticipating parties that might want to utilize the outdoors at the same time, but that's never happened. Uh, and it, uh, I believe, should be uh, any decision about using the grounds involves, all, it's a whole nother kettle of fish to me. Well, it's uh, problematic because of the playground too. Yeah, I was about to say that's an interesting thought with the playground. Hmm. That, that could be a separate playground. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a uh, so it's simplified. I didn't really make any changes. I just got rid of the rates uh, for full facility. The original rates that the board had already approved are still the uh, rates for the conference room. Um, and I also wanted to just also uh, make sure that we're saying that this is the right number, right occupancy number limits. Uh, we had had uh, just mentioning what was on the certificate from the fire department somehow becomes very misleading to the general public. Uh, the general public seems to think we can hold 89 people. They can do events with 89 people, but that's with no chairs and no tables. So that's not an event, really. I and mean, I don't see many instances where you would have 89 people in that small conference room uh, so there's little things like that. I'll forward that uh, the copies of the draft one for the FY222 uh, rental agreement. We've had some calls, but as I just mentioned, uh, when I mentioned the occupancy uh, with 
tables and chairs is limited to 39, those people have not answered back. So I don't, we don't have any pending dates right now, except, uh, except people aren't getting back to me. I will get back to them just one more time, given that we're discussing it tonight. But the biggest problem to get through is security. Just to make and sure. Chase working on that. Yes, and I actually saw our, we have our, here, our vendor there today uh, talking about it, I believe. Um, but yeah, um, so I can present now. I'm sorry I didn't have this uh, together before the packet and the slideshow was put together. Okay, well, I think we, we can, you know, if you email it to us and just give us a copy of the draft, we can look at it that way. That's not a problem. And, okay. you know, attack it from that angle. Now, if, here we go. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? This one went a little longer than anticipated. This is, it is 9.05. I am calling to adjourn it if there, I hear nothing. And everyone have a safe rest of your evening. I thank you all for joining us and I appreciate all your input. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Take care.